Are you Bhagyashree? Uh, yes, Shweta, am I audible? Yes, yes, you're audible. Okay, thank you. Gandhiji once said, and I quote, we are addicted to our thoughts. We cannot change anything if we cannot change our thinking. Good evening, everyone. I warmly welcome all of you to the 29th webinar of the Inter Society weekly webinar series. The topic for today's webinar is establishing sustainable smart cities in the COVID-19 era and beyond. We have successfully paired these days of gloom with our heads hung over screens and minds lost in the ambiguity of our future. The COVID-19 crisis has affected societies and economies all around, all around the globe and is bound to permanently reshape our world as it continues to unfold. Undoubtedly, the necessity to bring up about new insights into the long-term sustainability, sustainability of a smart city arises. To talk about this topic with immense pleasure, let me welcome the speaker for today's webinar, Dr. Iza Muhammad Bastaki, President of University of Dubai. Welcome, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, next I would like to welcome Suhai, sir, Harindra Lassa, Akhila Gauri Shankar, and all other eminent personalities gathered here for the session. I also welcome Fita Fatima, MC for today's webinar, and all other participants to this event. Once again, I welcome you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bhagishri. So now I would like to welcome engineer Suhair A.K. of the Vakamalui Foundation Trust, who is the chair of IEEE PES Kerala chapter to introduce our speaker. Can we have you, sir? Okay, good day to all. I'm extremely happy and most privileged to introduce the distinguished speaker of the day, Professor Muhammad Al Bastaki, and share some golden memories of our earlier association. Professor Bastaki is an Emirati, meaning a UAE national by birth. He hails from a famous Bastaki family in Dubai. His grandfather, Abdul Razak Al of Bastak, an astute businessman, was invited by Sheikh Maksum II in 1895 to settle in Dubai. Bastakia, the place they lived, is a center of attraction in Dubai today with a nice restaurant and heritage buildings. Professor Bastaki did his higher studies, graduation, post-graduation, and PhD in electrical engineering from the University of California, San Diego, and Irvine. Communication is his main field of interest. Dr. Isa Basaki is currently the president of University of Dubai. He was former CEO of the ICT fund and his did commendable work in that position. During his uh, distinguished career, he held many senior positions. Excuse me. Including the director of education and technology at the Dubai Silicon Oasis Authority, chairman of the energy section of the UAE University and chairman of the technology section of the technology and energy research center of the UAE University. Dr. Bastaki is one of the founders of uh, DSO and RIT Dubai and he is the founder of the IT center in Alain Municipality. In 2009, Dr. Bastaki received the highest, UAE's highest award, the Emirates Award for Science, Arts and Literature in the field of sciences. He is a recipient of Sheikh Rashid Award for Scientific Excellence. In 2014, he received the Middle East ICT and Knowledge Development CE your Excellence Award. My memories of Professor Basaki dates back to late 90s when Harindalal and me took up the assignment under the government of Sharjah. We got connected with Professor Isa, who was then the chair of the IEEE UAE section. Having come from Kerala, a vibrant center of IEEE activities, we felt UAE section can do a lot more than what has been going on. When we conveyed this to Professor Isa, he asked, do you want to take over? We said, no, we only want to help you. Rest is history. Professor Isa built an energetic team, which included many Keralites, K.R. Venugopal, Taj Kolara, besides Harindilal and me. We all enjoyed working under Professor Isa's leadership and uh, guidance. UAE section grew 
much larger and won many laurels. He got connected not only with the leading universities and utilities, but also with great personalities like Professor Abdurrahim Kaib, who later became Prime Minister of Libya. Professor Isa is an inspiring personality with a smiling face, a sense of humor, and quick actions. He's going to talk to us on establishing sustainable cities, smart cities, the COVID-19 era and beyond. A topic of contemporary interest, which we are, all of us are looking forward to hearing. Over to you, Professor, for your Leonard talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, distinguished uh, fellows, uh, Mr. Hindralal, Mr. Swear, uh, Abdul Qadir, and the rest of the team. I would like to thank you very much. Good afternoon or good evening from your side to all of you. Actually, if I look at, uh, when I talk about establishing um, uh, establishing uh, uh, sustainable smart cities. Uh, it's very important to understand that I'm talking about sustainability more than anything else. I may define smart cities, but I like to make it sure it's sustainable. And I'll give you a formula. That formula will help to establish this kind of sustainable smart cities. And as uh, Mr. Swear said, I've worked very much with uh, people from Kerala, engineers, professionals, and especially with me in IEEE, they helped me a lot. And I remember we also, I remember we, we also um, celebrated the first 1,000 members in such a small country. We became a big section. Uh, only three of the whole Middle East and Africa, they had two and we became a third. So it was the effort, the collective effort of all of us, and thanks to Ms. Hanida and uh, Taj Kolara and uh, Suhair Abdul Qadir, it made it happen. So if I go back to my speech, uh, 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 there's the same thing, I just put a different way to look at it. What, for me, before I start my lecture, my, my webinar, I always look at something which is very important, the human capital. Uh, I think uh, people always talk about what in the future will robots take over. I say, whatever we, we serve, always the service comes to the human being. We build real robots to serve human beings. If we go into plantation, we serve human beings. Uh, vegetables serve human beings. Food, fruits, whatever, serve human beings. Electricity serving human beings. At the end, the human capital is the main part of the whole, whatever we are, we are endeavoring to make it happen. So I think human capital is very important and it will never go away. It's always there, no matter how kind of technologies come in, they always will be helping for the human capital, for the human being to excel and not the other way around. So if I look at some of the uh, wordings of our leaders in the country, UAE, United Arab Emirates, this is what has convinced us to direct all our resources to building the individual. So this individual is the wealth of the country that will progress with only this kind of individual. So I just underline the word individual. Again, wealth is not money. Wealth lies in men. And here men means it's a generic men and women, by the way. And this was said by the late Sheikh Zaid. He cared about the individuals and the human capital. We go to the next leader. The Federation of the United Arab Emirates has relied and will continue to rely on the rich and diverse contributions of its true wealth. What is it? People again. So people are the wealth of any nation and any society and any organization. This is by His Highness Sheikh Khalifa, President of UAE. Again, a true leader said that, yes, we seek to make people happy and making people happy will be our objective and mission, mission until it becomes a permanent and deep rooted reality. 
So we want to make it something, a habit that will be in, within the, any organization to make people happy. The positive leader, leader does not succumb to circumstances. He or she makes the best out of them in order to build a new future for the people. If the leader works for the people, then he or she is the right leader. Of course, by Zahani Sheikh Mohammed Rashid, Vice President, Prime Minister, and Ruler of Dubai. Again, a true leader said, talked about education. Says, if we invest in education now, then after 50 years, we will be celebrating when we export the last barrel of oil. So this is a plan, a long-term strategic plan, not to depend on, on oil after 50 years, to completely be the, uh, diversifying in the economy and make sure that every other sector will be as, as uh, progressive as the others. And of course, he also said no place for those who lack science and knowledge. So it's science and knowledge is the foundation of the people who will work towards the progress of the country and the other societies. This is Ali Sheikh Mohammed Zaid. He is the Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi and uh, uh, Deputy uh, uh, Armed Forces uh, 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 Chair. Now, this is my speech. I will give you the formula in the first slide. If you feel that you got it, you don't need to attend the rest of the, uh, the session because I'll be talking about this formula. First, I'll talk about introduction and vision of UAE, requirements for sustainability of smart cities during that and after COVID-19. Number one, leadership and innovation. So this is the, one of the main part of the equations of the sustainability. The th second is knowledge-based society ecosystem. Ecosystem has also some elements within education, quality and only quality, research and business development. Maybe I like to uh, should you can underline the business, so RNBD. The problem with some of the places, I'll talk more about it, that they look at research just to publish a paper or be promoted from associate to assistant to a full professor or assistant to full to associate, but they don't care about adding value to the economy. Then, uh, let me just take this off. So, and the third one is innovation and entrepreneurship. And I'll talk about this also in detail. And of course, there should be a very uh, robust ICT infrastructure. We have the whole ICT infrastructure in the country, but Ankabut is for mainly for research and education. It's a national research and education network. It's like Internet 2 in the United States. And uh, Janet in uh, UK uh, and others also are there. Third element, so the three elements, leadership and innovation, knowledge-based society ecosystem, and the last but not the least is future trends and technologies. So we need to foresee and foresight the future. We need to look at future foresight and see what is it we can do and draw scenarios. According to those scenarios, we build our present projects to meet the future trends. Of course, a summary. So this is my whole, so it'll take you one hour, take me one hour to finish. And anytime you can stop me if you want to. So post-COVID, what happened when COVID started? Then we had some of the things, right? So we look at survey uh, senior decision makers in 25 countries. The survey said that main thing was for, this, for these senior decision makers, the priority was number one was safety of employees, which is 71%. So again, we talk about human capital. It's always a priority. And then of course, without the financial uh, stability, I don't think you can make the employee safety. So it's also very important. Second uh, priority, third priority, optimizing costs. Third priority is maintaining business operations and customer retention, retention and satisfaction. They're, they're all are important, but the, these four are very important for the COVID era. Now, there are no new normal norms of this, like an increased, and the share of employees working remotely, it happened. Uh, 
uh, and then reduction of the, of the need for office space, less digitization business process and so on. And also remote work became a common practice. For me, I'm working at home, but believe me, I want to go back. The reason is you work more when you are working remotely. If I have a meeting anytime, I could meet after five minutes people. But if I'm in my office, I, need the, I either need to meet them after one day, or after two days, or after three days, or after four hours, five hours, but now we meet continuously. But we achieve more. That's the positive thing. More online, more digital, high business, uh, uh, mobility, more safety measures in an ongoing basis. Now we're looking at safety measures, more empathy, tolerance, and flexibility. I think these are the main traits of, even though a lot of negative things in, uh, in COVID, but these are the good things that happen in COVID. Now, if you look at it, what, I mean, when the term manpower demand is, is important to, to actually consider ways of working, how it? One of them is work, what work should be co-located and where? So you have to decide what work can remain at home, what work can be done more efficiently, and I think a lot of them have been more efficiently, what, what work can be automated and what work can be eliminated. So I think these are the, uh, the results of the COVID, which will continue with us after COVID. And it will happen, but social distancing will not be anymore, of course, they will not be there anymore, but work uh, distance it will, it will be there, remote learning, remote working, it will be there, but not 100% in most of them. Now in Dubai airport, post COVID, what happened is the following, when we started the first time to open. Can you hear it? Yes, yes, good. So you see, we try to become, uh, try to be adaptive and become innovative in uh, continuing the business uh, process. So we continue the business regardless of the COVID available or not. So I think it was a very innovative way to solve this problem. Now let's look at introduction and vision. Strategic vision after oil to achieve a long-term sustainable, prosperous and productive lifestyle after oil for UAE's next generations. So we're talking about to make sure that lifestyle is sustainable, it's prosperous and it's productive. Once it's there, that means we can actually uh, succeed in becoming sustainable even after oil. And of course, there are requirements to achieve that. The requirements are the following, as I said, quality education, research and business development, innovation and commercial entrepreneurship centers and robust, secured, high-speed, seamless and reliable ICT infrastructure. These are four elements to make this a success. What's the goal? What's the result? Why are we doing this after oil? Is because we want it to be made in UAE, so globally. And other societies can say made locally, so globally. So if we succeed in these four elements, we will be making things that can be sold globally, especially we're talking about UAE because most of our uh, income comes from oil. If you look at the history of electronic technologies, I'll go very quickly, uh, so I don't waste time. You know, why the analog communication started with Graham Bell in 1878, and then wireless started in 
with Marconi, even though there was proven that uh, Sir J.K. J. Bose from India, he, he's actually the one who did the experiment of wireless, but Marconi got the, uh, the recognition. It was recognized by IEEE, by the way. And then discrete, wired, wireless, then discrete communications, and Nyquist bound, which is sampling theory in 1928. Digital communication started with Shannon's theory and invention of transistor, 1948. Satellite communication, 57. Optical communication, 1958. Internet, birth of internet was in 1969. Internet age, which was in 90s, of last uh, century, world internet working then. Information age in the first decade of 2000. And the second decade, knowledge age, smart cities, fourth industrial revolution. Uh, revolution and cognitive digital age, which is future after the, the second decade. Second decade and third decade will go on. It'll be a cognitive, it's robotics plus, plus cognitive uh, intelligence, not only artificial intelligence. So fourth industrial revolution, there are some elements that uh, mm -hmm. empower fourth industrial revolution and uh, support the fourth industrial revolution. Blockchain is something that people are talking a lot about. So this is a main element. Second element is Internet of Things. Third element is big data. And when you say big, it's really big. It's really huge. There was one project uh, somebody had bought from Google, uh, one, ex, one exa, exa byte just for one project. You can see how big the big data is. Then we have artificial intelligence, virtual reality, and augmented reality. We have robotics, we have biotechnology, nanotechnology, cloud computing, and 3D printing. Of course, these are some of the future technologies that are coming into being. And this is the main uh, elements of uh, fourth industrial revolution. But the technology of technologies has come already is the 5G. Now 5G will stay for a while, even though there's a plan to have 6G in the end of this uh, decade, but I think 5G will still be there because it's the technology of all technologies. We'll talk about those in more detail later. Now, X cities, how did they evolve? We started with E city, remember electronic city, services online. Then we have M city, services on mobile. Then U, U city, which is ubiquitous city. E and mobile services everywhere. And then smart city, which is knowledge-based, knowledge -based, ubiquitous services to everyone. Of course, we can have smart classrooms, smart health, smart tourism, smart building, smart transportation, it goes on. Smart energy, smart agriculture, smart security, and smart list goes on. This is all we need to do an RMBD in all these kind of uh, big data, cloud, security, IoT, 5G, AI, CI, uh, and it goes on, AR, VR, Now, if you look at what is the definition of smart cities, can, how is defined? Cities that deliver digital ubiquitous services from and to anyone, to any device, to anywhere or from anywhere and anytime efficiently using a main infrastructure, ICT infrastructure with robust, super speed, reliable and secure ICT infrastructure. Now, Smart Dubai uh, start, started in 2000, and if I'm not sure, I'm not mistaken, 2010. Uh, oh no, 2006, I think. Well, I'm not sure about the date, but it started to turn every service in Dubai into smart services. So the first thing was to make Dubai paperless in 2021. We are working on it. I mean, the government only. We're talking about government. And then to have to have a toolkit for every user for ethical AI toolkit, and then a lab for all the uh, government organizations to use it, artificial intelligence lab, and then startup support. If you're a startup, you get, get support from this. And happiness agenda. Happiness agenda, they want to make every person, every entity, every organization to become a happy. And of course, blockchain. Blockchain, they want to make sure the blockchain is there everywhere in the end of 2020. I think there's a delay because of COVID but it will happen. University of Dubai actually has this, uh, its uh, uh, degrees all on blockchain completely. Then 
We have smart cities global network to collaborate others to help them uh, grow. These were the initiatives. Now, what apps do we have? Dubai now. We have 52 services, smart services that link to the other organizations from Smart Dubai. Now, this is different when I talk about uh, uh, Dubai Now portal. This is a much advanced. So this is the beginning. Then Dubai careers, you can go and get work from this uh, app. Happiness meter, every government entity has an happiness meter that checks person's happiness. He or she leaves that place. So we are trying to make people happy. That's why the services are becoming so good that all, most of them are getting more than 90% of happiness. Now, UAE Pass, of course, that's a signal you'll have everywhere. You don't need your ID card. You don't need anything. Everything will be through your mobile completely, the signature, everything. And then this is some kind of guidance to where you want to go, Rashid. Rashid means actually the, guy, the, uh, the guide. That's Rashid in Arabic. Then smart employee, smart supplier, you know, and supplies for the government. Dubai Pulse is uh, the backbone part of smart city and Dubai Now portal. The same thing I talked about Dubai Now, which is here. Now, this is actually everything is on, on one click. You go to the smart Dubai Smart app, you do everything from there. You're not linked to somewhere else. So that's the beauty of it. Everything is just one click. And then, of course, the GRP, Government Resource Planning. So this is the Smart Dubai initiative to make every government uh, entity smart, plus every person and every government to be every entity to be happy. Now, the second element is the requirement for sustainable smart cities with knowledge-based uh, economy, leadership was number one. Leadership is actually the one that steers the people towards the progress of the country or the society or the team or the group. Whatever leadership there is, there should be an example and so on. I'll be talking about this also. So when I talk about leadership, I want you young leaders to be lions and work towards leading lions who initiate, suggest, debate, and achieve. What he meant, of course, this is given by Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid. He talked to the young leaders, don't, if you want to be lions, don't lead sheep. You will never be lion. To be strong, you need your followers to be strong as you are. And that's a good lesson for all of us. And again, another very well-known uh, leader said that thinking, thinking is progress, non-thinking is stagnation of the individual organization in the country. Thinking leads to action. Of course, knowledge without action is useless and irrelevant. Knowledge with action converts adversity into prosperity. So it's very important to look to think. It's very important to act on that thinking. And once you do that both together, you will turn everything into prosperity. And this was said by the late uh, Dr. Abdul Kalam, the ex-president mm -hmm. of India. Again, we choose to go to the moon in this decade and do other things, not because they're easy, but they are hard. So if you want to be good leaders, we want to work hard. Nothing comes easy. As they say in America, easy come, easy go. It doesn't work with easy. Everything is hard for you to succeed and become number one. And this is by John F. Kennedy in 1962 speech, famous speech. Leadership is a function of knowing yourself, having a vision, and be well communicated. You have to build a trust among colleagues and take effective actions. This is the formula for a successful leadership. But how will you recognize a leader? Leadership is like beauty. It's hard to define, but you know it when you see it. So leadership, you can't exactly describe, but these are the traits that will make a leadership a success. This is by Professor Warren Bennis. He passed away, I think, 10 years ago. Now, what are the traits of the leader? A leader should have a vision. That's number one. And a leader should know how to plan to reach that vision. A leader should be ambitious and innovative. If you don't have an ambition, you'll not have any real feeling to work, to do something. And you want to reach to a point, to a peak, to a summit, you have to be ambitious to reach there. 
right? A leader should lead by example. Don't tell to do people other things and you do something else. A leader should empower. Give the followers the power to do it. If you have a vice chair, the vice chair should have the power to do everything. But empower is not enough. You have to also enable to give them the tools. If you have the tools, you don't give them, there's no use to empower. And a leader should produce leaders. If you're not producing leaders, there is always uh, discontinuity and the sustainability doesn't, doesn't come. A leader should be bold. You have to take the risk. You can't just say, I will do it if it's, it can be done 100%. A leader should think out of the box. You have to always don't continue thinking into a small box or a big box. You have to open completely. Let, the, yet, let, let your imagination be open. And that's where you be innovative. The last but not the least is a leader should create a favorable environment to bring the, out the energy and ability of the team. This creative and favorable environment is very important. You need to work and feel that you are appreciated for what you're doing. You are respected for what you're doing. You are loved for what you're doing. This is how you will excel. A true leader said also that in, a, in the book, an easy life does not make men, men mean men and women, nor does it build nations. Challenges make men, and it is these men who build nations. The race of excellence has no finish line. So you see, once you have a, a goal to reach a peak of a mountain, once you reach it, you see that there's another peak in front of you. So there is no finish line. You finish one line, you go to another line, another peak. Simplicity starts in the heart, away from negativity and pessimism. So you have to be always optimistic, always optimistic. Even something negative happens, you think it's negative, you always look at it as an opportunity. A true leader is one who creates a favorable environment, we said, to bring out the energy and ability of the team. A great leader creates more great leaders and does not reduce the institution to a single person. Change or you will be changed. If you're a leader, you tell others, you change or you will be changed. Leaders who neglect the good of their people will be forsaken. Leadership is a service, not a gateway to privilege. If you think you are a leader, so you have a lot of power, you are, you are, you are, you are mistaken. It should be a service with this leadership. Of course, this is extracted from the book of Reflections on Happiness and Positivity by Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid. Second of knowledge-based society is smart education, number one of this, quality and only quality. So UAE leaders in response to COVID, if you look at COVID, one leader said schools have stopped and universities have closed, but education will not stop. Education as health will not stop in all circumstances. That means it's a, uh, it's a red line. You can't cross it. You have to have schools. You have to have education no matter what the situation is. Even if you sit on the ground to learn, you have to learn. And this is very important. Why UAE was ready for, for COVID? For the last 10 years, we have been investing in intelligent learning, electronic and smart services, and emergency and disaster preparedness. Preparedness. Today, we reap the fruit through the continuity of our education process and our basic and proactive government services in dealing with global health conditions by Sheikh Hamba Rashid. And also, the whole world is going through difficult circumstances. The UAE is fortunate. Why? Besides all the services, smart services, our circumstances are even easier because of several key factors. The first of which is a concern of the cadres who have taken responsibility for confronting the emerging coronavirus in the front lines from the beginning. So we have those frontliners that protected the society. And they were very sincere, very dedicated to make it happen. This protected us a lot. And of course, he said, medicine and food are a red line. No matter what happens, medicine will always be uh, served. Food will always be there, will always be supplied. So food and medicine are red lines. So the government will be working on it. This is by Khazan Shubhan bin Zayed. This is what our leaders did, not only said, did in the COVID era. And till now we are in the COVID era. 
Now, what is a smarter, a smart education? Smart institutions are institutions that deliver digital, ubiquitous education and services to any student from any instructor, anywhere and anytime, efficiently using digital pedagogical tools based on a robust, super speed, reliable, and secure IC infrastructure. So once you have this anywhere, at any time, from any professor to any student, from any teacher, no matter what, where you are, this is known as a smart institution. So every service is given remotely. Now in Dubai Future Foundation, I think actually they have a lot of initiatives in one of them is the Smart Dubai. Plus others are coming. 10X is one of them, many of them. More than 775 million school children have been affected by school closures around the world as a result of COVID-19. The UAE has what? The opportunity to become a regional hub for online learning in the region. So EdTech is very important. Now, steps taken by the UAE ministry, I'll not go through it, I'll just pass quickly. There were a lots of uh, uh, decrees that made the lives of universities and schools, uh, secondary, tertiary, and even primary before for K to 12, to make it easy for us. So there were some exceptions given to the universities and the schools to have it, but there was one condition, as much as you can, don't compromise on the quality. And the, re and the learning outcomes and the program learning outcomes and course learning outcomes. So these are the main things. So all these are the decrees of the Ministry of Education. It was for every general education, higher education and training institutions, all of them. Now, in 2016, in Gulf News, Gordon Brown, the ex-Prime Minister of uh, United Kingdom, wrote an article called The Ticking Education Time Bomb. It was, uh, it was a heartbreaking article, by the way. Half of the children, all the children into 16 will leave school without even the most basic of qualifications. We are talking about 1.8 billion. That means 900 million of them will be out of, of education. And among them are refugees, child laborers, young girls who are forced to get married, all these, plus, when the Western countries and some rich countries spend $100,000 over the child from grade one to K to 12, there are countries that only 1,000 dirhams only, dollars, sorry, for the whole uh, 12 years of 14 years. It's just 14 years. That's how bad those places are. So we need to help those countries that are in need of this kind of education Somalia and Central African worth $320 per, per student for the 16, for the 14 years. But the problem is the education uh, spent was only 13% in, in terms of uh, aid develop, aid development aid. It came to 10%. But for health, it, the other way around, it came to 18%. That means we need to uh, advocate for education uh, aids more than what's there. That's why Sheikh Mohammed, uh, had an initiative. So we are looking at disruptive and innovative education to implement it to solve this problem of one half of the children of the world will be not educated as supposed to. Now the Mohammed Rashid Global Initiatives Innovation, I think it's one of the best initi initiatives ever in the world in the 21st century. It looks at um, uh, all poor countries and build schools and uh, trains teachers and uh, provides books for them to learn. Then it builds hospitals to eradicate diseases. And then it helps the entrepreneurs to become successful uh, startups so that they can help the GDP of their country so that they can be sustainable and self-dependent, uh, completely independent from others. And this is the initiative. So 23 million people to be treated and protected from blindness and eye diseases, it happened. Two million households supported, enabled in 40 countries. 10 million children benefited from education initiatives. It, it was $1 billion uh, project. 3.2 million books printed and distributed. 1 billion investment to create 
to create the great environment for creators, innovators, creators, innovators. 1,400 programs, 116 countries went to, uh, to poor places, poor, poor societies, and 280 strategic partners and 54 million beneficiaries. So they built 2,126 schools around the world, 400,000 teachers trained, 10 million children benefited from education initiatives, and 3.2 million books printed and distributed. It's a continuous, by the way, process. So it continues to grow. And I don't have the latest number. So to go towards uh, innovative, uh, disruptive education, it's very important to look at the following. Technology should be as an innovative tool, introduce techno entertainment that gets the attention of learners in students, learn anywhere, anytime, and by any means, virtual reality as a face-to-face -face learning using cloud computing or IoT. So we can have a face-to-face -face learning through virtual reality. And second one is adaptive curricula. In the future, the curricula will be adaptive because the changes will be drastic and we need to uh, uh, follow the, uh, the changes that are happening in the world, especially in technology. So market change job requirements and rise and fall of specific job descriptions. So we have to look at the trends of these markets. Three, innovative faculty, no rote learning. We want to make sure that if faculty are innovative, that will let the students love to learn. Thinking out of the box when they teach and delivering creative curricula. Four, research-oriented learning, even in schools, broaden the scope of mind. Team and collaborative working habits, which says that two brains are better than one, and of course, innovative and creative thinking, inquisitive minds, for them to be entrepreneurs, led future entrepreneurs. We have to deal with these to become disruptive. And last but not the least, to create an environment of love to learn. So we have to make sure that students will love to learn, they will learn if they do it. So what is the disruptive education? You know that, what are the goals of objectives of, of education? One of them is to achieve, achieve course learning outcomes and program learning outcomes. Let's say electric engineering and power engineering. Every course you take, you have to achieve outcomes. And all collective courses together, they achieve the program learning outcome. If you achieve all of it, you get your degree, right? So the, the goal is to do all this. It doesn't matter all this. It doesn't matter how you do it. Secondly, you have to make sure that it's L to L. It's love to learn, explore to learn, experiment to learn, work to learn, and innovate to learn. All those should be a part of the learning process and the learning system. Once we do it, we will create that disruptive education. So, the disruptive education explained a flexi time educational system. You don't have to go to university from five to from nine to five or from eight to six or whatever. You don't need to study at one o'clock or two o'clock. It's a flexi time education system and a location independent. You don't have to be in a certain area. You can be in a, in a beach enjoying and suddenly you realize you want to learn. You can go and learn. Plus education on the move, driverless cars. You can also learn. A flexi instructor system, any worldwide instructor. You can have any worldwide instructor. The instructor will be uh, evaluated, will get ranks, will get uh, grades, and he can know how good that person is. And you look for your own uh, uh, goal. Where, where do you want to go? So you can learn from anywhere and use the blockchain to be paid in seconds, or maybe less than a second also, seamlessly. An open time degree system. So it's not a four-year degree. And of course, we need a high-speed ICT system. Then what is the result? No worries of receiving education in terms of time, place, and structure and condition. 12-year schooling could be reduced to a minimum of nine years. And I say nine years because less than nine, the student is not mature enough. Capacity building starts later. And university degrees could be obtained in a year less or more. It could be less or more or a year. This is the disruption, and most of the uh, standards of the world, they don't allow it. 
but it will come soon to allow, as long as you're achieving the goals of any uh, degree. Now, this is just a uh, commercial break, University of Dubai, but we have College of Business, Dubai Business School, College of Law, College of Engineering, Center of Executive Development with training. We have entrepreneurship, innovation, free zone. By the way, this free zone was a, a, a 50 chart of Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid. He had a 50 charter and Article 6 says every university in the country, private or public, should have a free zone so that to uh, produce uh, entrepreneurs and startups. So the universities will will have students graduating as academic degrees plus startups. And then center of business and research development, that's one. One of the things that, this is the campus of University of Dubai. One of the things that achievement of University of Dubai, which I think we need, every new university should follow, we became the first, first net zero energy campus, which is known as net zero energy building. The first in the world. What did we do? We built a, a solar plant, a solar farm that produces 1.7 uh, megawatt hour, plus we have parking lots, so the total will be two megawatt hour, and it covers all the electricity, solar power. We, we are not using DIY anymore. Uh, then expected inter internal return of in return, uh, rate of return with 23%. So for four years, or nearly five years, we'll, we'll break even. Expected payback in five years, expected saving during is 1.2 million per year. CO2 emissions will be come down to 2,040 tons. Total project cost for 5.4 million and system design in 30 years. So the first five years we'll be paying. After five years, there'll be no carbon footprint and there'll be no cost. So anyone wants to build a solar plant for the organization, it's an initial cost will be high, but in five years or six years or four years, it will be sustainable for at least 30 years. And of course, the other things that, were, that I talked about. So I think it's good to go for solar energy. The second is research and business development. And again, I say, underline the business development. <clears throat> if you look at research statistics, in 2016, you can see that the number one in the world was South Korea. You see, this is the number of scientists in a country for per million people, the vertical. <clears throat> and of course, the horizontal is the percentage of uh, uh, research spent with respect to the gross uh, GDP. <clears throat> and this is how much it's spent. It's called GERD, <clears throat> gross expenditure on R&D. So the biggest is United States, second biggest is China. But in terms of the percentage spent, <clears throat> South Korea was number one, Israel was number two, Japan was number three, and so on. Qatar was not bad at that time. It was 2.8, maybe a seven. <clears throat> In 2008 or 17, can I drink water? In 2018, uh, Israel became number one. It was four point something. South Korea became two. But you see, China is changing the size. United States changing also, but you can see later how big it is. Qatar came down. <clears throat> you can see here, <clears throat> India is doing well. UAE is very small somewhere here, in here, I think, somewhere here. Egypt is not doing well. All of these are uh, low, these are high, and number of scientists are very low. Look at these, look at Finland, how many scientists they have per million. And then mark this Scandinavian countries, you can see, but Singapore is also there, <coughs> non-Scandinavian. non, non uh, Scandinavian. In 2019, South Korea jumped to <coughs> three, four point four, I think. Israel became second. And in 2020, till now, Israel is number one, it's reached eight, four point eight. And the China is coming close to, to United States. <coughs> <clears throat> now, this is, these are numbers you can see, 14, 15, 16. I'll just show you that United States, the GERD, which is uh, gross uh, expenditure of R&D, it was 514 uh, billion, and China was 398. 
Of course, percentage-wise, China was low. It was 1.98. It was 2.7. And you can see that Qatar was number one Arab world, and then Saudi Arabia, and then Egypt. UAE was not doing well. 11 was 0.5, then it was 0.6, and 2015, 0.866. But in 2019, this is 19, not 16, you can see it was a forecast at that time. Uh, of course, if you look at the GDP of United, China, is much more than GDP of the United States now, 26 trillion, or 20 trillion. But you can see the research expenditure is 519 billion and it's 581. Still, is number one United States but China is catching up. Denmark, if you look at it, it's, it's look at this three, uh, I think, sorry, it's, not, it's supposed to suppose Qatar, Qatar. Qatar is, came to 2.5. And then this was Egypt. And this was, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and Egypt. This the three. Let's look at UAE. In 2018, it became 1.3. If you look at the trend, UAE is improving a lot. So I'm sure now we have gone more than 1.5. So we are in the right track. <clears throat> so the average annual rate is changing a lot. You can see how fast we're growing. Now I think we are number one in the Arab world in the research the expenditure. Now, some, as you can see, some technology of the future what will be the most important technology beyond 2020? 27% said big data, 25% robotics automation, 24% nanotechnology, 22% cloud computing, 22% sustainability, 20% renewable energy, 17% artificial intelligence, and 15% bio nanotechnology. Of course, 5G is always at the top. And these are the details. You can go in embedded processing, hybrid manufacturing, sunlight, and so on. And this goes on, by the way. Quantum computing is coming also. <clears throat> now, to look at why I'm calling it R and BD, as I said, the problem with the with the Eastern world, I'm talking about the Middle East and and uh, mainly Middle East and North and Africa, is that. Research is done just to be promoted from assistant to associate or associate to full professor, or want to uh, publish a paper in one of the journals of one of the conferences. But there's no intention in having a product out of it or producing a patent that can be commercialized and can be marketed. So I think we need to change the culture of this, this area to make sure that B is there. I know in Europe, United States, Eastern Asia and Australia, they don't need the B because always there. <clears throat> They're all doing research and development using business-wise uh, uh, products. But we need to change the culture first. We need to make sure that academia are, are very active to prove to the industry that they're capable of doing research, <clears throat> applied research, and industry should also collaborate, but academia should start. Government should always either uh, initiate funds or create some kind of um, uh, culture, plus also have some kind of uh, regulations to improve research. And of course, private sector always there to help as venture capitalists or as co corporate social responsibility or as partners to help grow of r and Third one, innovation, incubation, and entrepreneurship. <clears throat> The UN National Strategy in 2014 was National Strategy for Innovation <clears throat> was very important <clears throat> for all of us because we have priorities now to make it happen. <clears throat> so I I was I said that for in seven sectors. So the objective of the national innovation strategy is to simulate innovation in seven sectors. And this is what I put. The rest <clears throat> is transportation, health, energy, water, renewable energy. So this education, education, water resources, renewable energy, space, and technology. These are the seven sectors we have to uh, innovate. Of course, 
there's not limited to seven, but the seven are priorities only. <clears throat> the other seven, and we already tackled all of them in the UAE. We have also entered the space uh, uh, sector, and we are trying to do more than that. <clears throat> if you want to be innovative, never underestimate the value of the, an idea. Every positive idea has within it potential for success if it is managed properly. A needle was invented one day, it became one of the most important things in the world now. So nothing, don't demean anything. Everything is important, but you have to have the right sex manage. You have to manage it properly and have the right way to do it. Of course, you remember I told you there that uh, the biggest risk is not to take the risk. So you have to take the risk. You have to be bold to take the risk. And this is said by Sheikh Muhammad Rashid. He said, we have to take the risk, but it has to be a calculated risk, of course. Also it says you miss 100% of the shots you didn't take. If you didn't take any shot, you'll always lose 100%. But if you take a shot, you will, the possibility of hitting is always more than 0%. So it's better to take those risks, but of course calculated risks. One of the problems we have, that the greatest danger for most of us is not that our aim is too high and we miss it, but it's too low and we can reach it. We don't want to reach somewhere where we can. We have to make sure we have to try to reach where we can't. This is where innovation comes into being. <clears throat> but we don't have to forget about humanity. Einstein, Albert Einstein said, try not to become a man of success, but rather to become a man of value. You add value to humanity. This is, should be your main goal, your main objective. Of course, it's not enough because what well, Edison says to Edison, anything that won't sell, I want, I don't want to invent. So you need to you need to live, you need to make money, but you have to serve humanity. So you put them together, you'll be a successful inventor. <clears throat> if you look at global innovation indices, you can see that uh, I will talk about about 2020. What are some countries doing to become high on GII? This is a global innovation index. The first country is Switzerland, then Sweden, then United States. I'll talk about these three. If you look at the Arab world, United Arab Emirates is number one in the Arab world. It's 34th. And India is second, number 48. Saudi Arabia is third, number 66. <clears throat> Tunisia, Tunisia 65, Saudi Arabia 66. We go, continue, Qatar 70, Morocco 75, 78, and so on. Bahrain, Jordan, Oman, Lebanon, Egypt, Algeria, and the worst is Yemen is 131. This is the last one here. Uh, why GII is important? Because there's another one called KEI, Knowledge Economy Index. Knowledge Economy Index talks about four criteria. None of the criteria talks about knowledge creation. That's why it's not a good index to follow. This is a very good index to follow. The reason is it looks at the institution, political environment, regulatory environment, business environment, that talks of human capital and research, education, tertiary education, research, looks, talks about infrastructure, talks about market sophistication, talks about business sophistication, knowledge creation, and then talks about creative outputs. These all elements is where you, it leads you to become number one. So why Switzerland number one? The main thing, because it was number one in knowledge creation. Of course, the others are either second, third, some of them maybe 30, but generally speaking, in creating is number one. United States, Sweden was number two. You will look at it also, knowledge creation, number two. So United States is number three. You look at it again, it's number three. You look of UAE, you look at UAE, first in the Arab world, third in Nawa. Nawa means uh, North Africa and West Asia. Uh, Israel number one, Cyprus number two, UAE number three. If you look at it, we are excellent in action tertiary now. Tertiary becomes so well that in, in rich countries, we are number two somehow. Education, we are number 17. It's not bad if you can see institutions, we are political environment, we are very good, 21. Uh, and in infrastructure, we are 11, which is excellent. General effects, five. 
In technology, we are very close to it. Sometimes some we are first, some second, some third. But a problem is knowledge creation. Knowledge creation till now, we have not achieved. We are 78. And in knowledge creation itself, we are 104th. So I think here is where we need to look. That's why we are emphasizing very much in UAE to uh, uh, fill this gap. We have already filled 50% of it. And next year, you'll see the, the difference. Of course, 2020 means the result of 2019. In 2020, in 2021, you see the differences. I think this one will go up, will come down. In last year, we were 34 in our rank. This year, 36, this year, 34. Next year, I'm sure we'll go to nearly 20, maybe. Innovation areas, technology innovation is important. The main thing, that's why I'm looking, because there's government innovation, innovation systems, business model, but I'm looking at technology, technology innovation. It's the virtual augmented reality, sensors, human enhancement. This means research areas, by the way. Biotechnology, artificial intelligence, robotics, uh, advanced materials, 3D printing, blockchain, mm -hmm. telecommunication general like 5G, talking about IT, information security especially, talking about uh, and blockchain, talking about uh, entrepreneurship, and then of course, which covers all fourth industrial revolution. These are the areas we have to work on from now. If you want to give, commit any idea, you always look at a model that you have an idea, you are reviewed, and then after you review, you pass, you go into uh, an incubation center. So you have incubate, all incubators right here. And every service is given to you. All of these are given to you. Some of the incubators forget the BAC, which is Business Accelerator Center, which helps the incubator to be successful as a startup. So you need to give all these services. Once you give all the services, marketing, business development, sales support, accounting, legal, entrepreneurship training, mentoring, soft skills training, venture capital access, this is very crucial. We are weak in UAE in this, but we are working on it to make it happen. Already there was a new thing. There was a NASDAQ for SMEs and launched in Dubai yesterday. This will help the SMEs to get help from VCs, strategic partner access, recruitment HR, IP management, intellectual property management, and to community support. If we have all the support, we can guarantee a graduate or a startup or exit strategy for it. Now in UAE, to become innovative, we had some uh, awards. We had the annual drones for good award, which I was the chair, and annual robotics and AI for good award. I was the chair also. And Emirates Energy Award, I am the chair for two years. This continuing, but the first two, I think it's frozen till now. And then there's Hamdan and Muhammad, uh, Innovation Award for Project Management. I am the Vice Chair of the Board of Trustees of this one. So we're working hard to make sure that UAE will import uh, technology and transfer knowledge. We're looking at transferring knowledge. Mohammed bin Rashid Space Center started with South Korea to build the satellite. Satellite three, Dubai Sat 3, which was Khalifa Sat, was built 100% by UAE nationals. So it was complete knowledge transfer. Knowledge transfer. This is what we are looking at. There's a big project in Dubai started four years ago. I was a judge in this one, it's called 10X. I want to see what 10X is. I'll show you a small video. Thank you. 
So you see, uh, I, because I'm a judge of those uh, uh, projects, about 163 projects from 36 uh, entities in the uh, Dubai government and 25 projects succeeded. Believe me, if you see those projects in 2025, Dubai will be living like Star Trek era. Airport will be completely different. Every service is different. Drones everywhere, taxis everywhere, uh, flying taxis, I mean. It will be so much different, you'll not believe it. And this is exactly what's happening now. So the Dubai government is working on so many projects, 25 of them, to make Dubai faster than any, than any city in the world. And it will happen. Of course, the, the infrastructure is very important, especially on Kabut for education and research. I'll, not, I'll be passing by quickly. Feature technology and IoT. Machine IQ will be coming into being soon. Any machine television you buy, it will be uh, graded by its IQ. Depending on the IQ you will, you will, you will buy, it, has, it, has thinking, uh, it will be thinking humanly, it will be acting humanly, thinking rationally, and also acting rationally, these machines, television. So television will understand your need, will understand who's sitting beside you, and will do whatever it, it sees as per the intelligence of the machine. The higher the intelligence, the more you pay. So it'll not depend on TV, but how much intelligent quotient it has. So television will be, uh, will have an IQ, coffee maker will have IQ, refrigerator, air condition, house, car, road navigator, phones, any device, and the list goes on. This is what the future devices will be. Of course, through IoT. Energy harvesting is another thing that we are working on also in Dubai and UAE is that we are trying to clean the environment first either renewable energy or cleaning the uh, non-renewable energy like the uh, fossil fuel energy uh, generation. So we'll harvest all the uh, carbon dioxide emitted to get it back. One of them through heat, which is we know solar energy. The other one is mechanical movements. The third is heat, any heat happening and also the electro electromagnetic waves. All this together we can harvest to make a clean environment. There are lots of research being done on this. And mobile towards 5G, of course the 5G is the future. Even the 6G is coming, I think it's just an improvement of 5G. Uh, uh, it's energy efficient, even though the speed is high, energy efficient so good that it will not affect the bodies, our bodies. And also it will have uh, an internet cloud. So cloud region area network approach. And also it will be moving, will be self-centric. So devices will be cognitive, the devices. And devices will decide which frequency to go if there is any uh, available frequency. And then more intelligent terminals, uh, especially mitigating interference, either communicating directly and so on, communicating directly to other devices plus new technologies, the like massive MIMO, full duplex and talking machine to machine. What is it happening? It's going to be 20 gigabits per second downlink. The peak data rate for current LTE cells is about 10, one gigabit and the uplink is 10 gigabit per second. 20 gigabits will be split between all of the users, of course. The more users, the less you'll get, but they're guaranteeing uh, 100 megabits per second. So it's a guaranteed 100 megabits per second anywhere you are. Minimum one, mil, mil, one millisecond latency. This is, I think, a breakthrough. Of course, I think we'll go for four milliseconds, but one millisecond is the minimum required. And this will be good for remote uh, surgery because there's no latency, there's no delay. Everything is uh, live, you can do it without any hiccups. So it's very good to do everything online. One million connected devices per square kilometer. This is where IOTs will come in. And 5G, they're working hard to make sure the IOTs are ready to implement it for 5G. One million is not a small uh, amount in one square kilometers. Of course, that's the other standard, the moving. The moving is until the zero kilometers movement to 500 kilometers per hour, the 5G will guarantee good thing. My son tried the 5G on Sheikh Zayed Road in Dubai. He got 873 megabits per second, 873, 873. 
that's how it, it moved. It was, he was going 120 kilometers per hour. It's especially good for the for the trains. You don't need a Wi-Fi or anything. <clears throat> now, cognitive anti antivirus technology is known as uh, cognitive early warning predictive system. A book written by Dr. Rocky Termanini talks about. <clears throat> Uh, protecting the bodies because future everything be wireless you'll have a capsule follow, uh, um, uh, swallowing swallowing uh, a capsule that will take care of your body will give you insulin will cut something if you try, if you hack it you will kill a person so you need something called cognitive early warning predictive system for smart cities that means we need to predict earlier before it happens and this is the story of smart safe vaccine and this smart vaccine will be on it's the digital immunity system will be mimicking the biological uh, immunity system so we can use uh, smart vaccine the same as biological vaccine and then we'll have vaccination as a service for cloud services of course you know cloud computing so, um, software as a service infrastructure as a service platform as a service virus uh, vaccination service and health as a service all these are coming but now dr rocky termini has written a new book just come out a month ago called dna deep hacking drone assisting assisted dna sequencing biohacking we're talking about protecting everything bio uh, bio means mimicking the bio engineering internet of things i'll not go through it it does everything Plus, you can study with me also. But the thing is now in Tokyo, everything will be IoT. I mean, uh, your sh the shoes, the wearables, the boats, the canoes. The doctor will know if the sp sprinter has a problem or sprinter is doing well. And the trainer will know how good he or she is doing, can help as it goes through the uh, IoTs in, uh, in the ball, in the hat, in the whatever you're wearing, in your hair, in a t shirt, in your rackets, anything. And this, of course, uh, was from a, a paper from uh, Francisco Maroto. He is an expert in IoT. And age is not an issue. Everybody can use now mobiles, even the one which is so small. I think there is a joke. There is one photo saying that a small uh, a boy of one year old telling by phone, a grandfather how to connect to wire to to wi-fi that's how it's going to happen in the future well i'll uh, i think i'll stop because the all three i talked about but at the end the goal is for us made in us or globally for the other places made locally or globally and this is what we're looking at so summary what are the requirements to build a sustainable economy quality of education research and business development Research and business development, it's funding, established venture capital funds, incubation entrepreneurship centers, made in USO globally, and ICT infrastructure. Of course, smart, fair, and command leadership is the main requirement for the sustainable economy. And the other one is, it's very important to look at basic research, 30%, research and development to spend 50%, and research and business development, 20%. So what did the famous Schwab say? Professor Klaus Schaub, we need leaders who are emotionally intelligent and able to model and champion cooperative working. They'll coach rather than command. They'll be driven by empathy, not ego. The digital revolution needs a different, more human kind of leadership. And I think he is describing the leadership of UAE, which we are proud of. So we know that the future favors the bold. In his famous book by Lester Thurow from IT, he has written that book. I say the future is what our imagination leads us to. The future is what we create now, today. And the imagination of the future is limitless. Thank you all very much. Thank you, sir. Sorry, I took so, a long time. Uh, yeah, so, so, so can we move on to the question and answer session now? Yes, please. sure. OK, so there's a question from uh, Tyler Anantakrishnan. In your assessment, how long, roughly, will it take for a big country like India to achieve the concept realization of smart cities in full? Uh, I think um, 
India is, is more, much more difficult, of course. It's a huge country in terms of area, also in terms of population. But you have to go city by city. Cities you can. As you, long time ago, you had Bangalore and the other city, you had the two cities we have, can't remember the other city. So you had already these smart uh, services, but it wasn't serving the, it wasn't serving the community. It was serving the world. So I think you need to go by these rules in every city. You can start with five cities or with 10 cities and slowly grow, but it depends what are your capabilities. Believe me, smart city capital cost is high, but in the long run, it will prevail. It will actually be, uh, be uh, return of investment is, is, it will come in five years or something like that. Like we did in, in renewable energy, it happened. So I think you should start it. Once you improve your economy of the country's GDP and improve the lives of the people, you'll not find anybody hungry. And no poor people be there. I'm, I'm not saying poor means there are people who will, will uh, earn less, but you don't find somebody not having food and living in a clean place. You can do it through this. If leadership is not successful, it will never happen. Okay, sir. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you, sir. So the next question is from uh, Shweta. And how can uh, students from India be part of UAE in building smart cities? I think we have. Uh, I have one, uh, one video with just seven minutes. It's about so many projects we had in the Future Foundation. And I think two or three of them are from, were from India. So I think okay. a lot of opportunities are there for the projects. Uh, but you, know, you need to be innovative. If you're being innovative, that others have not done it, what we are looking at is something that others have not done it. As Star Trek, we are, we are going to a place where nobody else has gone before, right? So we want something that's innovative and is different from the world. You're going to be ahead of the world. If you do it, believe me, you're the first one to do it. We have many companies in, uh, in uh, UAE and Dubai are uh, uh, Indian uh, businesses. We have them, many of them. Not one, not two, not 10, but a lot of them. Indian community is very strong in UAE and, and they are the second, the first largest uh, community in the country. We are the fifth, maybe or sixth, the UAE nationals. We are at 10%. But I think you have the chance to be to be that, but you need to create your startups that will serve this. As in terms of getting jobs, it's become difficult nowadays. So jobs are more difficult to get nowadays, but projects, yes, you can do it. You know, one of the things that we were doing, I remember I called, I told Emirates Energy Award, the one who was doing the assessment for us, you know, we have like hundreds of uh, projects coming from all over the world. An Indian company, it's part of the government, it's called NPC, I think, and they were doing completely. So we outsource this to them. If you, have, if you have the capability to do, so you have to always come, go to Smart, Dubai Smart app or go uh, uh, website and look at those, where one of them is to find the, where the projects are. Find those projects and there, then you can apply for it. Okay, so, uh, so it's like innovation is what matters and uh, yes. right, sir. Yes. So, um, so next is a question from uh, N. Ravindranath. How can India expect to build a smart country after COVID-19? How long COVID-19 will remain in the world? Rebuilding the uh, damages caused by the pandemic will take how many years? These are the basic questions we need answers. Uh, <sighs> he would like to know your suggestions. Well, I'm not a foreseer. I can't forecast the future, but I can, I can have some kind of idea. One of the things, by the way, are look at the webinar, look at the education remotely done. Why COVID only affected the health of the people and some economies, but it didn't affect the education and some other works and uh, businesses because there was technology. Technology is where you need to go to become successful in the future. And in India, you are very well made in, in soft software 
uh, software engineering. You need to go to produce more than that. Is there, is there one smartphone, one smart device company that's uh, competing with uh, China and South Korea and Japan and United States or Europe? I can't see one, right? Maybe you can own one outside. You need to build your own, not just software. When you build all these, you will be capable of taking care of the COVID. COVID, as experts say, it will stay for two years. And because the vaccine as a process, it take two years to finish. If you expedite it and go fast forward, it may finish in one year. So some expect that maybe in, 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 uh, in March 2021, we could a little bit relax. But it's nothing is, uh, is known. Technology will help. Even I think the solution for virus, technology can help. Uh, because biomedical engineering is a big part of medicine. Without it, medicine will never, uh, ex uh, will never uh, excel. So I think technology is a must, future technology is a must, but the virus will stay. I hope that in, in um, March it finishes. But if you, if you say so, it could be March 2022, what others expect. But I don't know, it's not a uh, final word for me when it finishes. Okay, sir. There's a question from uh, Mohan and Nayar. Sir, how big will the participation of UAE in the upcoming NEOM project, Smart City, uh, in Saudi Arabia, which is said to be the largest of its kind? That really, I don't have any information. So I don't know, I can't respond to that. I don't have that information. I'm sure that we are uh, okay. uh, helping so a lot of countries, but I don't have it. Okay, sir. Uh, so there's another question from uh, Taila Anantakrishnan. Uh, so she mainly focuses on, um, um, on uh, signifying the problem that our country faces. So in India, poverty looms large when there is no food for the stomach. How can anyone uh, think of this education uh, that your concept suggests? Well, uh, the problem is education because there's lack of education. So of course, people will be poor because of lack of education. Why did I talk about the global initiatives? It's going to communities to help the education to succeed and eradicate the power and help those entrepreneurs. So I think if I am hungry, I need to do something. I need to cultivate maybe, but I have to do something for me to live. If you sit there and you're, you are uh, hungry, you will be hungry forever until you know, you know what. So I think if you think how to provide to yourself, but you be innovative. Education is a very important part of it. Anywhere in the world you go that are the first world countries, all of them are well known in education. So that means education should be there. Even if you're hungry, learn as much as you can. Now the education can go everywhere. So if government of, uh, of uh, state or the whole government of India, if they can provide education to everywhere wirelessly, wirelessly, then you can be sitting down somewhere and, and planting something. At the same time, you can also learn. So learning, you have to learn. Without education, you never prevail. Your you will stay the same. Look, look, at, look at China, the second economy, I think the first economy in the world. But in terms of R&D expenditure, uh, they're the second. And they have a, a, a huge uh, area. They have a huge population. But still, they're doing well. So I think education should be a main part of it. Even if you're hungry, try to learn. Believe me, not be hungry when you learn because you can do something that can help you to become yes, sir. Yes. Uh, so there's another question from uh, Venkateshan. UAE appears to be pursuing a uh, blockchain technology seriously. What are the areas where applications are envisaged? Uh, <clears throat> blockchain, I'm not an expert in blockchain, but I'll tell you one thing. Blockchain is a service given uh, as uh, uh, general ledger, a ledger is given it to you and you build on it on a block of a chain of blocks and you can't cut it. It 
it's always there because there are so many miners around the world that get the same information. Even if you cut it, it will not happen because there's other, the, the majority will rule. You can have it in your, your certificates can be on, uh, on, uh, on, uh, on blockchain, either professional certificate, degrees, plus banking could be done. If you want to pay somebody through blockchain, there is a ledger that says, we have so much money in this bank and a transfer to this bank so that my ledger will change. The other ledger will change with a very sophisticated connection and, uh, and security. And we don't need a mediator. We don't need credit cards. We don't need, bank, uh, we don't need building banks. We just need banks as names. And so blockchain will help secure our transactions. It's, I call it uh, internet by transactions, IoT by transactions. So the internet of transactions, even in uh, project management, you can do it. Uh, contracts can be done through uh, blockchain. So there are many ways to do it. Blockchain is a platform over the internet that will help uh, your transaction to be secure and done correctly, directly. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. So there's another question from Anika. What is the scope of sustainable smart cities in India? Do I know about India? I don't know. What, what, I need to know that question exactly. What is the scope of sustainable? Maybe what is, how, how can they be sustainable? As, yeah, I said, yeah. as I said. Yes, what is the scope of establishing sustainable smart yeah. cities in India? Yeah. That maybe that's what. I think, you know, um, leadership is always number one. Leadership is always number one. If you compare the GCC countries also, why UAE is the most successful one? Because of leadership. There was, in the beginning of 21st century, there was some, uh, uh, what do you call them? Uh, I forgot the, the word. There were some people who were uh, jailed because of, uh, What's the word for it? You, you misuse the system. Anyway, so uh, they were jailed and out of many numbers, only few of them were actually uh, guilty. But the whole Dubai learned the lesson, don't do it. corruption, sorry, corruption. But try to remember corruption. So there was some corruption. From that day, the corruption became nearly, I can't say nearly zero, but it has to be there. So I think the leaders should take care of corruption. Every city, every state, they should look at the corruption first, how we can solve it. This is where leadership comes in. If you do that, believe me, you will be the most powerful or second most powerful or third most powerful. The worst thing will be the third most powerful country in the world. Get rid of corruption. That's the, that's the job of the, of the leadership. Once leadership is successful, then you do other ones. Other ones are easy to do. Because you have the brains, you have uh, the resources, all kind of natural resources you have. So you are rich in everything. You need a good leadership to do it. Yes, sir. Uh, there's another question from Dr. Anand Panikar. Focus on people and happiness is great, but centralized control through technology may contradict it. Uh, please comment on it. There's no centralized control. It's not centralized control. It's a, it's an um, uh, indicator. For me, I am University of Dubai. I give services to students. If the students don't like to give me 50% or 40%, I will go and, and try to improve. So it's an indicator for me. It's not centralized that you have to be happy. No. We will, the entities, the enti gov government entities that are working in Dubai, they want to serve the people correctly so that their uh, business will grow, their services will grow. So I think it's not centralized as much as giving you an indicator to become better. It's like you have iOS, you have other uh, uh, things, not, uh, yes, uh, ISO, ISO, you have ISO, you have other things, all these you have. Why? To know where you are and how you can improve. So this is an indicator. If we have a meter, measurement meter, that we can do it for ourselves or give it to the device smart to check for us. It all depends on mine. I have the choice. 
but it's not centralized. It's improving ourselves only. Yes, sir. Uh, there's another question from uh, Anakha. Currently, India is moving towards becoming the most populated country. How do you think this will affect the implementation of the concept of sustainable smart cities in India? I am, I'm, I don't know, I, they keep asking about India, I'm, I'm from UAE, but I know good about India. I can speak, I'm Hindi, I'm Hindi, so I can speak Hindi and I know India a lot. I'm a good friend of India anyway. Uh, so the question again, how? Sir, currently India is moving towards becoming the most populated country. Yeah. Yes. So how do you think that this yeah. will affect the implementation of the concept of sustainable smart cities? I think, uh, uh, when we talk about smart city, we're looking at betterment of people. That's the main goal. And it will not work other way around because smart cities give you services easily and quickly with no delays. So you will be free to do other things. I think smart city means that your services will improve. Once the services are improved, by the way, the corruption will go less because service is done automatically without interference. And if it goes through a blockchain, then even corruption will be zero in the blockchain. So I think smart cities will help uh, India to become, uh, to live better. Population increasing, yes, but when they'll come, you need to control it. But at the end, China is bigger and they're doing well. Yeah. Uh, so there's another question from Professor Harry Harin. Creativity and innovation are subject to deterioration with overstructuring and with overstructuring and need for conformance. How do you tackle this? Innovation. Uh, innovation. Innovation well. are subject to deterioration uh -huh. with overstructuring and need for conformance. Uh, how do you tackle this? That's why do overstructure anyway. I don't know. Uh, you see, anything deteriorates. Uh, but the thinking always improves. The brain deteriorates, but the thinking is always better. So I think innovation will not deteriorate. And um, uh, once you innovate, actually you, you have done something good for yourself and for the humanity. It will continue. Uh, maybe you're talking about don't pressure yourself. Well, People pressure themselves to do so many things. You want to be innovative, you have to do pressure on yourself. Today you'll do pressure on yourself, tomorrow you'll relax. Because at the end is the, the, is the result that counts. Once you have the good result, you will forget about all those things. It will never deteriorate. So don't think of a such, uh, of, uh, of something will deteriorate, anything will deteriorate except thinking. Brain also would, but thinking will not. You are the one who will control your thinking. Be positive, you can do so many things. Never look at something impossible, look at something that is as a challenge. Anything in front of you, it's a challenge. I, I'm telling you, any engineer here, if I tell you design anything, we'll do it. It's an electric engineer. Any design that you think is impossible, you can do it. But is it feasible economically? Maybe not. So nothing is impossible, everything is possible. 100 years ago, nobody would dream what we are today. They would say it's impossible, no one can do it. It will happen always. So there's always a progress and they will never come back again. It never return. Deterioration is not their innovation. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. So that's with the question answer session. And so there are many uh, comments in the the chat box, um, emphasizing on the information that you uh, shared with us. It's really good. And uh, especially what you ta uh, talked about education and the importance of leadership. I would say that uh, those are the key points that you emphasize many times. And uh, that was really good, sir. And uh, so uh, before, we, before we move on, uh, I would like to request everyone to kindly fill the feedback forms, which is att attached along with the invitations. And uh, those who have registered will be receiving a recorded video as well. And uh, so next, uh, now I'd like to request uh, Akila Gauri Shankar of CSI Trivandrum chapter to give the vote of thanks. Can we have you, sir, ma'am? Hi, 
thank you fida that was a very informative session so thank you so much <laughs> it was and i have been in uh, uae i mean dubai specifically for 14 years so and i have seen how it was in the early days and then we are always impressed by the growth and thank you so much for touching upon the latest projects and it was really great and uh, thank you so much for our, taking time from your busy schedule and giving us uh, such a Uh, energetic and very informative and uh, um, what is a motivating talk actually yes uh, we are <laughs> really impressed to see yes 10x that was a very beautiful video and we are wondering those 25 projects we'd like to learn more on it of course i'll google and find out more as well sure uh, everyone will say yes it is disruptive innovation uh, you have touched upon so much you have motivated us all sir thank you for that great speech and uh, yes we all need uh, sustainable smart cities that is a need of the hour and uh, i think uh, covid has in a way helped us this uh, uh, into getting all this uh, education online and all that so uh, it is a blessing in disguise to get more into this line i believe thank you so much sir uh, uh, sincere thanks to you sir thank you for inviting me thank you very much yes and uh, our special thanks to our uh, mr suhair uh, for introducing our speaker of the day and uh, yes harindra lal sir needs a special mention because he has been great in uh, getting us all these sessions in a uh, sequential manner without any disruption for during this covid period now we are on the 29th uh, session uh, of this uh, Uh, current C series because of uh, face to face cannot be done so this online series it is going on very beautifully because of the tireless efforts of harindra lal sir thank you so much sir and uh, let me thank bagishri also for giving the welcome note for our speaker and mc uh, fida for the beautifully coordinating the session and i really ex express my sincere thanks to all the leaders from all the uh, chapters i mean all the uh, that is uh, part of the societies i triple kerala section institute of engineers kerala state center computer society of india trivandrum chapter project management institute kerala chapter internet society trivandrum chapter vikram maulavi foundation trust trivandrum and i to play engineering medicine and biology kerala chapter for uh, joining the hands and making these sessions uh, very lively and very interesting uh, each week we really look forward to the topics that we have to we get to hear from learned and very experienced speakers thank you so much all leaders and thank you participants for uh, giving us a very interactive session by all your uh, great questions thank you so much uh, all of you now i hand over to fida for uh, giving the details of uh, next week session thank you ma'am uh, and sir i would say uh, it is really good that uh, you commented on how we can improve how the indians can improve on their uh, um, on developing smart cities and many other things as well as you told and uh, and as ma'am said uh, harindralal sir's efforts to conduct these uh, webinars are really appreciable and they and these webinars are really informative and uh, a treasure when it comes uh, when you are spending such uh, times in the in between the pandemic and you're all in your homes and when we get such information it's always worth it sir and thank you harindra sir also yeah and uh, i would like to thank you most very much and swear also my friends ah uh, yes sir and uh, so i'd like to inform all of you about our next talk that is the inter society weekly webinar series talk number 30 and it's really uh, we are we are approaching the 30th talk so you can just imagine how far we have come and it is uh, the next talk is on building institutions of excellence a holistic approach by professor ms rajeshree phd she is a vice chancellor of apj abdul kalam technical university kerala and it is on the 4th of november wednesday from 6 to 7 pm and uh, Once again, I would like to thank everyone for this session. And with this, we have come to the twenty-ninth talk of the Society Weekly Webinar Series. 
And once again, uh, thank you, sir, for uh, sharing such a moment with us and, and for uh, sharing all the information that you have. It's really worth it, sir. Thank you so much.